Hi, welcome to another episode of Art Matters with Wayne Quackenbush. I'm Wayne Quackenbush, the host and president of the Portsmouth Arts Guild. And uh, today we have a pretty unique guest, Christoph Matthews, who I've known for a number of years in an almost orbital pattern. We've run e to each other at different openings and shows and uh, he's a adjunct professor at uh, the University of Rhode Island and he teaches illustration of various sorts and uh, he has a pretty unique story and a pretty unique process. So Christoph, you are born and raised in Rhode Island and uh, apparently you're your parents were a big influence on what you do. So do you want to talk a little bit about your beginnings and education and all that good stuff? Absolutely. Um, I actually grew up right near URI. My father was a professor of English at URI. He's retired. My mother was a ceramics artist and she was a member of the South County Art Association. So from a very early age I was working with clay and other things like that. It's a really nice community there. I also was fortunate because I had a lot of exposure to a lot of art and illustration and a lot of comic work. Mm -hmm. So this is something that was a major influence as a child. And I also really enjoyed building a lot of things. And my grandfather was very kind to me. He would get me all sorts of things like Lego and various building sets. So I really developed a, an appreciation of the hands-on process of art making. So you have brought some of your creations which uh they're sculptures, but they're, well, maybe if you show one, we can Great. talk about how you put it together and what they're made of and, and what you do with them. So you want to bring one of those out? Sure. These pieces are what is called found object assemblage. And let's get that, if you want to get a closer look at this little fellow here. You can even put him on the okay, table. Okay, here we so go. That can, That's a good location so for that. focus on that. What that means is that these are made from various parts and pieces that I get from a variety of different sources. Mm -hmm. I disassemble things that are made of plastic or light metal, try to reduce those to the most basic shapes I can, and then I recombine those shapes using a combination of mechanical joinery, that is nuts, bolts, screws, rivets, things like that, and adhesives. Over that, I give that a coat of epoxy resin to lock down a lot of the elements, help with the transitions, and then I give it a coat of paint. I often use something like Rust-Oleum or Krylon as a primer, and then I will paint that by hand using both enamel and acrylics. Are on you that. hand painting the surface then? A lot of it. So okay. the base coat of it, like maybe the overall blue, I'll be using the spray for just to sort of block out large areas. But once I get into specifics, I'm doing the hand painting on that. Now this is only the beginning. That's right. Because I've seen you at work and I've seen you take painstaking measurements of each piece. And then what happens? Then the next phase is this. They exist both as a sculptural version. And in fact, before I go further, what I should probably also share with folks is this. I want to give people an idea of what one of these characters looks like before it has surface treatment. Okay. So if you had the proverbial x-ray vision and could <clears throat> see through solid objects or see through different layers, what you would in fact see on a character like this is that it's comprised of a lot of different shapes and pieces from different sources. Indeed, the chest on this is actually made from a little tasting spoon, like you'd get in an ice cream shop or something like that. Okay. So I like to show that to give people a sense of how that works. Oftentimes what happens is before I add the paint, I'll actually work with it from this point and I'll do 3D modeling. Right. So this is where this brings in the application that's called Rhinoceros 3D. It's a modeling software that works in three dimensions. And what I'm doing is I'm oftentimes using different tools like a calipers or one thing that can work nicely is for instance, your basic divider. You can get this at an art supply store, a basic ruler or something like that. That's and almost like a protractor. Very much yeah. so. So I can literally take measurements on that, take right. a look at that and say, okay, well, that looks like that's going to be about, oh, let's say, two centimeters. Okay. And so once I've got the proportions right on that, 
I can actually build shapes. I can do things like lofting shapes where you create cross sections and build it up step by step t -t 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 mm -hmm. like that. I can do extrusions, which is very much if anyone's ever worked in ceramics. Like when you actually have an aperture and you're actually forcing clay or some material through so it goes on path you can actually do what are called Boolean operations, which are very exciting, where one object actually fits into another object, and then you can subtract one from another. And the best way I explain that is, imagine if you had a Star Trek transporter, and you could literally select part of something and either take it away from something or add two things together, or even find the intersection mm -hmm. of two shapes. So that's how I'm working with that in the computer, so it becomes a fully three-dimensional model, and all these elements can be moved around, so I can actually set that up and pose it. I then add the surfaces to that, so once I've got that basically modeled, I'll paint this, and then I'll, in the computer, bring the colors into this. I'll say, okay, based on what I see here, this element should be blue, that should have some silver trim. So you're adding, is that what you would call the skin? Absolutely, okay. absolutely. And so once I have those surfaces in place, the next phase is I do what's called a render. That's where you're effectively very much like a photo studio. Like if I was taking product photography of this little guy and I had my camera there, I took, got the lights where I wanted them, took a nice picture there. I'm doing the same thing, except the computer is using what's called ray tracing to figure out where all the surfaces are and how the light should perform. Once I have that scene composed, where I've got this set up in its environment, with maybe with props, maybe with other figures interacting. Mm -hmm. I then take that render, I bring that into Adobe Illustrator. And that's where I begin the printmaking process. Because when you've got these things as a basic render, at its fixed size, it's perfectly good. If I blow that image up too much, though, it starts to break down. Right. All those pixels, there's only so much information on that. Right. Now, when I bring it into Illustrator, I am redrawing this as what's called a vector-based illustration. Mm -hmm. Now, vector is, simply put, a mathematical relationship of points. And the analogy I like to use when I'm teaching it in class is, if you've ever watched one of those Super Bowl halftime shows where people are marching in the form of a star or something like that, and they expand or contract, and you can see that from a sky view, imagine they're holding bungee cords. Well, the lines between those points are those bungee cords mm -hmm. or the vectors. This means that that drawing is infinitely scalable, right. which is marvelous because it means that for print purposes, even if I'm working to a comparatively small size, if I say, I want this to go up to be huge, I want this 24 by 36 or 48 by 50 or something like that, it means that I can enlarge that proportionately with no loss of information. I also love that because it, it's going to allow me to really control the color on that. And that's a marvelous thing, too. So I can look at that and make my own decisions about, you know something, even though the render tells me that that's a lighter blue, that feels really washed out. So I can simply go in there, and based on the information I have, I can darken all of those hues mm -hmm. and really bring that out, saturate that mm -hmm. nicely. Now. There's even more to it than that, because these, for lack of a better word, creatures mm -hmm. inhabit a world. Yes. <laughs> and that world has its own rules, mythology, ideas. I mean, do you want to talk a little bit about the, the, the deeper subject? Oh, absolutely. I call these characters endomech. And I really see these as a cyborg life form. They are the dominant life form in their environment there. And they are very territorial. They're always competing over resources, over their environment. So they're somewhat combative in that way. And they have uneasy relationships with each other. They have alliances. They have families. They have tribes, if you will. They certainly have guilds for different skills and attributes. Now, are they all unique? Is each individual, uh, it's a unique person, so you don't mass produce these in any Absolutely. way? Absolutely. These, each single one of these, no two of these are alike. Now, once you have all the data together, could you recreate them with a 3D printer, possibly? Possibly. I'd have to do a lot of work on the original 3D forms. The reason why is because <clears throat> 
what I will do for illustration allows me to have open surfaces on that. So that means things that may not have a full back to it right. or places where there might be gaps. In you. terms of doing 3D printing, you need things to be what they call watertight. If there's even the smallest gap, that confuses the printer and that can lead oh, to somewhat okay. messy results. Right. So it would take a bit of work on any given one of those to make sure that every single part of that. There are also places where they intersect, so I would need to be thinking in terms of, okay, do I make divisions in these places? I would need to be thinking in terms of also doing these as modular forms. Most of the folks I know who work in the toy industry, they wouldn't do a thing like this as one piece because there'd be a lot of complex undercuts. Right, that exactly. would, again, confuse yeah. the machine and yeah. you'd get a lot of extraneous material. So they would really think in terms of, I will do the arm as one piece that can later on be press fit or glued into place, the head as a separate one. So there's a fair bit of work that goes into that. Now you have a set up at my place in Newport and you've made a pretty elaborate diorama and uh, it, I would describe it as a beachhead because you have all of these handmade sandbags and all of these characters lined up and most of them have weapons and it, it's, uh, it's very martial. Um, and have you ever thought about this as, as a gaming system? I know mm -hmm. you're pretty inspired by gaming. Absolutely. And these characters look like they'd be fit. They'd have all sorts of uh, statistics and all that good stuff too. Absolutely. And indeed, one of the things you're going to see is the, the very scale of these is very much a sort of toy scale. Mm -hmm. I grew up obviously with a lot of the classic Star Wars, G.I. Joe, Transformers, things like well, that. We're and living certainly... in the shadow of the Hassenfeld brothers. Hasenfeld, absolutely. So you absolutely. Can't live in Rhode Island and not have some kind of sense of that. Absolutely. Yeah. Toy design is one of those things that really influenced this line, mm -hmm. really thinking in terms of that. And it's one of the things that even when I dream, I'll dream about toys that didn't exist or about things of that sort. Do you so. ever dream about your, your people? I do, actually. I, I dream about making all the time. I oftentimes dream about making things, making whole environments. So this is all pretty labor intensive. I mm -hmm. mean, how, how long does it take to build the module, measure it, and then, and then render it? And uh, we haven't even talked about your, your illustration yet, mm -hmm. other than, that, than that's the result of all the work. How long does it take to do something like this from start to finish? Can well, you even guess? It's challenging because one of the things is that I tend to work on several projects at the same time. Okay. The reason I do that is so I don't get stuck. I remember back in graduate school, I'd watch people who would focus exclusively on one painting. They come in, scowl at it, wipe some things off, make a mark, go outside, come back, wipe some things up, make another mark, and then throw down their hands and walk out. It's like, well, that didn't seem really effective to me. So. Yeah. Oftentimes, I'll have more than one of these characters on the bench at any given time, as well as some larger things. For instance, I have some very large masks that are part of a different series I've been working on. Oh, yeah, I've seen and those I've too. also yeah. been working, for instance, right now on some life sized cyborg birds. Oh, boy. So at any given point, I'll be working between illustration and sculpture and things like that. So that way, I'm constantly have something to focus on. So let's say conservatively, one of these figures, if I only focused on one, might take me about a month to physically build. Okay. In terms of the modeling, it depends on the complexity of the model. It could go anywhere from as short as a week to as long as a month based on how complex. The larger they are, the more elements there are. And then of course when you get into the illustration, that really has to do with how complex the scene is. So if it's a simple one figure portrait, that would be less time. If I have several figures in an environment with debris and equipment and things like that, that obviously is going to bring a lot more to the... Absolutely. Now, I hate to say it, but we've about run out of time. Oh, and my goodness. I All certainly right. appreciate you coming. Thank you very much oh, for my appearing pleasure. on the show. My honor and my pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Let me introduce our next guest on Art Matters. Uh, Elizabeth Hughes is relatively new to me. I've only known her for a few months, and we met during intake at uh, one of the shows at the Portsmouth Arts Guild. And it was uh, an interesting experience to see her work because 
what I got, at least from the initial meeting, was such a sense of peace and calmness and uh, plac placidness, I guess. Uh, looking at her work that she showed was almost like going on a mental vacation. It was almost like exhaling and inhaling and 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 it was great. So Elizabeth, uh, I know that you're from Massachusetts originally. Do you want to talk a little bit about your background and your education and how you started painting? Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I was born in Los Angeles, grew up south of Boston, um, began writing, uh, also dancing, um, came to Worcester, Massachusetts, and studied at the Worcester Art Museum, um, so began uh, visual arts, mm -hmm. the study of visual arts. Uh, traveled to Mexico um, to study Frida Kahlo on a grant from the Worcester Art Museum and really dove into visual art after that. Frida inspired me. Mm -hmm. So um, as far as your paintings go, uh, do you want to talk about maybe the one on the easel there first and, and talk about how something like that begins. I'm completely fascinated by your color choices because they're so different from anything that I would do. The, the pastel nature of it really is subtle and intriguing. So let's see what you have to say. Thank you. Um, this uh, piece I showed in uh, Worcester at the Sprinkler Factory, which is a beautiful gallery in Worcester, mm -hmm. Massachusetts. Um, and that was the last painting I did for the show. I kind of was under a uh, time crunch. And literally, the pink was wet as I was taking it to hang for the oh, show. I, I know that feeling. Last, yes. last mm -hmm. May. Mm -hmm. um, so it <coughs> really evolved. Um, and there's a lot of emotion in my painting. Um, there's landscape elements, natural elements. Um, and I would say, uh, certainly, um, my recent yoga teacher training, my kundalini training, um, kind of inspired this uh, the, with the concept of bloom. Um, so yoga as a journey to the self um, involves the study of the self, uh, always searching, um, and moving toward that blossoming of who you truly are. Mm -hmm. so now there's a, it's a still life, but it's a landscape and it's uh, internal and external exactly. and all of that is happening at the same time. Exactly. I see sky signs and air. It's, it's, it's very spacious and uh, again, calming. That's, that's what I get most from what I'm seeing. It's Thank just, you. Uh, so relax. Thank so you. Relaxing. Thank you. It's interesting because you know you don't see the part where I'm ah! oh, the, the, the <laughs> struggling. Struggling of it all. Right. You're, struggling. You're, you're, it's almost like you're. Well, I mean, painting is like a performance, and in a lot of ways, it's a lot like acting because mm -hmm. you have to you have to pretend uh, in a, in a lot of ways to get a certain effect. So while you're frantically applying and unapplying and, and working and, and struggling, you're also trying to project a completely different feeling. Right, and, and exactly. That, that, contrast that, that search there. for calmness, that search for perfection, quote unquote. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. and, and, and it's communication on a very human level. It's a lot of people don't really get the idea that Art is sharing, even if it's yeah. with, if you just make art for yourself, mm -hmm. you're, you're still exploring and communicating yes. within yourself. And, yes. and it, it's great that you can bring this out and, and show it to other people. 
Yeah. Now I know you have plenty of other pieces it here makes that we need happy. to get to. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so that was not from a photograph, but I often am working from a photograph. Okay. So you probably want to do it one at a time. And, okay. And you can even hold it closer to you. This is a fairly recent piece uh, from loosely based on a photograph uh, from a friend of mine. Um, and the photograph is of a pond at night. Mm -hmm. So I just began exploring what that meant, um, you know, physically, emotionally. Uh, and this is kind of what revealed itself. As Very I, luminous, and it could be air, it could be water. Uh, you, you're not sure where the ground is. Right, exactly. Yeah, little dream, little dream-like. Dream is a good word, dreaming, yeah. and, 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 and uh, almost like a dreamscape. Yes. Yeah, so there's that one, and the, um, the other one, actually this was the first one I did based on the same photograph. Now you want to hold it so the camera can see it better. Yep. Yeah. Make sure it's perpendicular. It's lovely. So that was the first uh, version, essentially. So from such, a, such a great light effect there. Yeah. With the, the contrast in the greens and the yellows and the, and the almost whites. So that's, a really, that's quite a range of color there. Thank you. That was fun to explore, and those were different colors for me, too. Mm -hmm. um, this piece was in the Jamestown Members Show, which was nice. Mm -hmm. Nice to have that there. So there's those two. Now, were your parents artists, or did you have somebody in your family that was an inspiration? Um, my mom is a very good writer. Um, and my dad was a very talented uh, artist. Uh, he was a lawyer by trade, mm -hmm. but a very good um, artist, talented um, you, drawing. You mentioned Frida Kahlo. Is there anyone else that you would look up to or consider an, an inspiration? Um, Redon, uh, the oh, French yeah. mm -hmm. symbolist. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, Marsden Hartley. Um, Matisse early on for the playfulness, I think, of his work. He got even more playful at the end. Yes, yeah. that's right. Those yes, dancers. I saw some of those cutouts, yeah, the paper yeah, cutouts. Yeah. Um, certainly, you know, classically Van Gogh for passion and magic. Yeah. Um, Louise Bourgeois. Okay. Beautiful stuff, okay. honest. And you have some prints too? Is that yes. A, is this a mono print? Yes. Yeah, so I, uh, <coughs> before I got into painting, I did a lot of printmaking. I love the. And again, hold it so it. I love the vertical. process of the printmaking. I love the paper, um, the water element certainly, um, and I was lucky enough to have a, a couple of well wonderful teachers at the Worcester Art Museum. Randy Lesage being mm -hmm. one of them. Um, my friend Patty Kelly also, um, and they have beautiful presses there. So I did a lot of printmaking in the beginning, and similar, you know, many many years later, uh, the colors come back. Exactly, yes. some figures, some landscape, mm -hmm. um, certainly abstracted. But uh, now, were you applying ink to a plate? Yes, a plexiglass. A plexiglass. Yeah. yeah, plate, wetting the paper, and I've worked in uh, water-based inks okay. mainly. Yep. A little bit with oil, but mainly water-based inks. Yep. The beauty of that is that you just, you never know what, how it's going to come out. Exactly. Until I love that through. surprise. Yeah. Yeah. I do. It's, it's almost alchemical. Now remember yeah. to be more towards the camera. Yeah. Yep. So that's another uh, monoprint uh, with some embossing. So this yeah, was actually so that gives a, a three-dimensional quality to the to the piece. Yes. Yeah. So I actually was working on a linoleum print that broke, and oh. so this is the wow. this is the result of that. So okay. what, was your, what was your first intention with that? Happy accident. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. <laughs> so that's the, and then this is another mono print. Again, kind of a watery, abstract landscape. So when you're 
when you're painting, do you apply your yoga practice? Is, is that a conscious thing? Um, not always. Sometimes it is um, in yoga, working a lot with the energy body. Um, that often kind of naturally comes into the painting process. And what about the breathing? Um, I should incorporate that more. I'm often holding my breath. Well, I mean, I, 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 I know the feeling. That's why I mentioned it, because I've worked with artists, and, and uh, well, I, I host a figure drawing class, and I have people who are sitting near me, and again, <clears throat> it's almost like doing a, a live performance. Yes. You're there in the moment, and that's the beauty of it, yes. and that's the beauty of painting like that. And I can hear people like just uh, like run out of air and they, they've been holding their breath and, and are yes. so intent that they forget to breathe. Yes. But your work just seems, I mean, it just seems like it's full of deep breathing, mm -hmm. if, if that makes sense. Well, I, maybe, maybe it's, uh, it's helping me, uh, you know, as I do a regular practice i'm sure it well it, i'm sure it helps it's me. also it helps there's me. the the mental purge of it all too it's yes. very cleansing too definitely uh, when you're painting do you feel like you're getting stuff from inside out yes yes and, and i think that's i think that's important for people yeah. um you know to communicate something that you feel is true something that you feel is beautiful and you mentioned poetry too, and we briefly talked about how writing and, and working visually parallel each other. Um, but sometimes you can't say things in words. It just, That's right. It's almost impossible. That's right. Or it requires more effort and skill. Yes. Than than you might have. Yes, there might be a little more freedom in the visual. Um, yeah, because. You know, take that brush or palette knife, and you know what I mean when I do this. Yes. Now you have one more piece, which is yes. a, a new one, and it's very, it looks almost like a, a whistler or a turner or something Thank you. Like yes, that. my friend also mentioned turner, no, William yeah, Blake. Yeah, it's just, it's just, and okay. that, that crazy sun. Yes, uh, and somebody said that was a Van Gogh. That was a crazy the era, Van Gogh. So. Yeah, <laughs> the spirals, absolutely. And, and that is the, it's the morning we have outside. You mm -hmm. know, it's a, it's a foggy morning on Aquidneck Island. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, this maybe is. Maybe over the ocean or maybe just over some fields. But look at the, you can feel the heat and, and the light and, and all of that just coming right through there. That's a, that's a pretty amazing piece. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I, this is uh, based on a photograph that I took. It's actually um, at sunset, um, and I'm not sure it's quite done. I think it might be done, but I'm still playing with it a little bit. Um, but that was real fun to just start with the energy of it and then coming back in to tighten up places, bring a little more light, a little less light. Mm -hmm. So it's a playing with light and dark, um, which I love the idea of. Well, I mean, we have just run out of time. All I right. really appreciate Wonderful. you coming down and thank you for appearing on uh, Art Matters. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that wraps up another episode of Art Matters with Wayne Quackenbush. Thank you for joining us.